attention I believe it's called so um, thanks for your attention I appreciate it so um, today uh, we're going to be talking about uh, nostalgia and of course as the old joke goes nostalgia isn't what it used to be um, and then thinking about childhood memories of childhood and the terrain of memory and I've chosen that word quite specifically because specifically if we're thinking about Rustin Kuzain's Dacha you see, it's very much a piece informed by a particular <coughs> geography um, of the Gorland, of Paul, New Orleans, um, as it was called. And you know, the, the, I was always thinking of that, that word uh, terroir for, for wine, being, being uh, as a wine man. The, the complex array of things that produce wine and its flavor, you know, extending that to the immensely complex array of things that produce our subjectivities in ourselves, which range from geographies, landscapes, weather, water, um, to social scenes, families, um, and to political contexts. You know. So I, I really like the essay for the way it seems to try and do justice to a range of um, elements within the place that, he's, that he grows up in. Um, Often we have this phrase, a sense of place, which I'm sure you know, or genius, or kind of, many literatures are sort of celebrated for the way they evoke a sense of place, whether it's Dickens' London, or, um, you know, Wordsworth's uh, <coughs> Lake District, or Carew, and many writers in South Africa. There's an essay by Eskim Pachele from the 70s. We looked at his autobiography in early lectures, which he, where he explores something called the tyranny of place. Which I think is quite interesting, where he's saying that place isn't always such a, a pleasant uh, and grounding force. It can also be tyrannical. There's almost a sense that sometimes you want to get away from the place where you're from, but it keeps on acting on you in a sort of tyrannical way. Or that it keeps, because he was writing from exile in America, and he was remembering his childhood in Moravastat, and he's compulsively remembering it. So again, we're going to see how. This question of nostalgia, which I think in general terms evokes a kind of warm, fuzzy feeling, is again pressured uh, given the context in which uh, these writers are emerging from. But let me first start with, with this. I remember the grown up feeling of going to a cinema with plush carpeting and wall and curtains in front and being shown to your seat by an usherette with a torch in the middle of the afternoon. I remember coming out and wondering why it still seemed to be middle of the afternoon. I remember watching Jailhouse Rock and thinking that Elvis Presley couldn't possibly be serious about all the hip movements and twisted faces he made. I remember being at a party full of adult-sized ducktails with broad green quiffs, leather jackets and stovepipe trousers. They went into the street to play a game of king stingers and threw the tennis ball as if they were trying to kill each other. I remember the sting of all the <laughs> I remember stingers. Terrible. Mm -hmm. Everyone has brutal, sadistic games of childhood. Like, run around trying to throw the ball at someone as far as you can. I remember when tennis balls were fluffier and almost white. I remember the cinema ad for Brill Cream in which Gary Player ran his fingers through. I remember the sweet oily smell of Brill Cream in its Scott Glass job. I remember the commotion in a Yodel bioscope during matinee performances. I should be really pausing between each of these and more, but I'm in a rush. I remember the ticklish feeling of a shongololo in the palm of my hand and the bitter smell of it behind me. I remember going on walks and collecting as many different kinds of leaves as possible, pressing them in a book, and later wondering what to do with them. I remember the soapy clean smell of our primary school library. I remember asking our grade two teacher if there was a special kind of chalk for drawing dotted lines. <laughs> 
I remember the sudden urgent need to pee in the middle of an arithmetic test. I remember my father telling me not to pee like a horse into the water at the bottom of the toilet bowl. <laughs> it's a moment in a boy's life when your father teaches you how to approach the urinal. It's a big test of manhood. The urinal. Um, I remember that our teacher poured glasses of Paris into a saucer and that I drew a fish in while it was wet. I remember that the night the first Sputnik flew over Johannesburg, I went outside to try and spot it. Every star seemed to be moving. I remember Yuri Gagarin's face framed by the visor of the helmet, and like a dog sitting in a space capsule. I remember thinking that gold was discovered on the Bartos run by someone who had accidentally kicked over a solid gleaming nugget of gold. I remember that two or three people, all called George, discovered gold. The surname of one of them was Honeyball. I remember one of the old boundary stones of Johannesburg on Boundary Road near the Louis Vuitton Avenue fire station. I remember my great aunt Essie's blue fiat with black rubber running boards and headlamps sticking out on either side of the road. I remember sitting at the back while she was driving down Louis Vuitton Avenue, humming elaborate homemade tunes to her, and then announcing that they were by far. <laughs> so, so it goes on. For pages and pages and pages, Dennis Hurston's I Remember King Kong, the boxer. King Kong the boxer, not King Kong the monster. King Kong the boxer, who then gets transmuted into a musical called King Kong, which I was playing when we, uh, when we walked in. And it got that, that distinctive sound written by Todd Machikiza, you know, it starred Miriam Makir, Bahu Masekela, all the greats of that era, the 50s, the fire town, which has in a sense become a classical locale, a locus classicus of South African nostalgia. Sophia Town, the fabulous 50s, stylish singers, gangsters, and so on. Um, that is then taken up by Dennis Hurston in this memoir. And in a sense, it's beautiful and it's true, and I'd love to carry on just reading it, the whole lecture. Um, but, you know, one immediately has to ask, well, what kind of place is this, are these beautiful memories happening in? What's going on around it? What's going on, on outside the borders of the text? When we looked at that um, <coughs> video of these <coughs> memory care units in the States which are trying to create s s false or s uh, simulated nostalgic environments like a small town America, I wondered what would it be in South Africa? <coughs> what would you even build in a memory care unit in South Africa to create a nostalgic experience? <coughs> So, you know, it could be, it could really be varied, uh, varied. Um, so, this is the cover of a beautiful picture of him there, I presume. Um, he talked about how he tried in this book, which is, it, 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 it maintains the same format, just a litany, I remember. Wonderful thing to try and do yourselves. Just sit down for an hour and just, almost like a form of automatic writing, just see what memories come out. There's something so compelling about the specificity of them, the small hard things that Coates talked about, or the mysterious hooks and catches of Emerson. What, what's, what's in that psychic architecture about? Um, the tiny intermeshed resurfacing coordinates of a gone world, he says. Beautiful. Um, the idea comes from Georges Perec, a French writer who wrote Jean Seguin, remember? Well, in French, it's got the reflexive verb. So I don't even know quite how to. I don't even know how that phrase feels in French. Je me souviens. So I remember, you translate it as I remember, but what is it? I'm, I, I remember, I myself remember, I remember, myself is remembering myself. I'm, I'm self remembering, because there's a je me, there's a double verb. Yeah, so I don't know if anyone is a non tongue French speaker. I remind myself. I remind myself. Yeah. Okay. I remind myself. So there's, there's a slightly different inflection there. He gets the idea from Perec. I remember that in Monopoly, the Avenue de Bourté is green, and the Avenue Andre Martin, Martin sorry, is red, and the Avenue Mozart is orange. <laughs> Some randomness of it, you know, the random. Um, I remember French kissing and figuring out it must have something to do with the tongue, since there isn't anything else in the mouth except teeth. <laughs> when you're young and you're trying to work out what sex is and how it all works. So, Perfect is an interesting writer who I love. He, he did a lot of Sort of, he was part of a group called Ulipo, uh, which sort of did a whole lot of experiments, like writing a novel never using the letter E. 
<laughs> or writing a novel only using the vowel e. Or writing a novel in Pilish, where if you think about pi 3.141, every word corresponds to the number of um, the words. The first word would be three letters, the second word would be one letter, up to 10,000 decimals. <laughs> so you create artificial, very strict constraints, and you try and work within them. And Ivan Vladislavich writes about this very love beautifully in The Lost Library, which is another beautiful meditation on memory. It's a book about all the stories he never finished, The Lost Library, and why. Um, the things that got away from him. So there's this, there's this sort of avant-garde conceptual register coming in here, even, though, even as it's very realistic. There's always that. But now, let's think about another kind of nostalgia in South Africa. This is the opening of Jacob Flamini's book, Native Nostalgia. To the Chinese, it was the year of the ox. To the Soviets, the year they said "yep" to the broadcast of the imperialist Sesame Street from Soviet television. To the Germans, the year both East and West were admitted to the United Nations. To the Israelis, the year they won the Yom Kippur War. To the Brits, the year car owners scrambled to fill up as government introduced fuel rationing. To the Americans, the year the Supreme Court legalized abortion with its decision in Roe versus Wade. And to Evelina Papai, Papai Chamini, a 45-year-old working class woman from Cotton Hall, a black township about 30 kilometers east of Johannesburg, the year her only surviving child was born, I was born on Monday in the Telsprey Hospital, a 900-bed edifice since condemned to demolition for lying on Dolomitic ground on 29 January 1973. And it's a wonderful game, sort of narrowing down. You know that exercise where I live in my address in the town, in this country, in this continent, in the planet, in the solar system, and <laughs> to do that. Uh, it's almost a sort of sense of like, running down to massive geopolitical things, and then there's me coming into the world, 29 January 1973. So this is, in a sense, the beginning of chapter one, but it's not the beginning of the book. It's about growing up in Katrahol. And he poses a sort of idea that it sounds almost blasphemous in this book. He says, I want to understand the question of what it means for a black South African to remember his life under pot like it's fondness. Now, before that, what I read you just now, because he gets this whole academic introduction because he's worried about his book being misread. And again, this is why I'm talking about the kind of risk that you know, compelling writing takes. When it was uh, published, um, there was a sort of brief storm in a teacup. Um, one reviewer said that he refused to even read the book. It was an insult. It was just saying apartheid wasn't that bad. It was disgusting, etc., etc. Now, actually, I mean, it's, it's not at all what he's saying. He takes huge pains in the beginning of his book to set up what he's doing. He's trying to say that there's a way to be nostalgic about the past without forgetting that the struggle against apartheid was just. And he said that actually to be nostalgic is to remember the social orders and networks of solidarity that made the struggle possible in the first place. And he turns to uh, a whole body of thinking and theory uh, drawn from Eastern Europe. Um, where, I don't know if you've come across the word, but nostalgia. It's a German word, or compound word, for nostalgia for the East. Nostalgia for East Berlin. Um, so, if you go to Berlin now, you can do little tours, nostalgic tours of what East Berlin used to be like. You know, the GDR and so on. You can drive around in a little Trabant. Trabant? Uh, Trabant. Uh, you know, even the little... <laughs> Put the green man across. I mean, you know, this is this is what where people's memories were anchored. I presume that was some kind of important toy, gherkins. I don't know. I guess those are quite universal, but maybe they were big in the DDR. Um, outside Budapest, there's something called Memento Park, where you can go and walk through the massive Soviet statues that have all been decommissioned. They've all they've all been chucked in. They may have been made into a kind of amusement park. Um, and I remember when I went there, they were all hollow. You know, they went. They weren't like the British Empire, such as the British Empire. You know, they were, they were um, so they sort of exist there. 
Um, Leica, there's Leica again. Hugely important memory focus for much life writing that comes out of um, Soviet, uh, Russia, and satellite states. And there was this film uh, a number of years ago, which is about um, the mother of the main character falls into a coma, and during the coma, um, the burn wall comes down, and then uh, when she wakes up, she, she's supposed to not have any shocks. So uh, her son and his girlfriend sort of contrive to pretend that it's still uh, East Germany, like that, 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 that Soviet communism hasn't fallen yet. And there's one scene in the book where he's talking to her and suddenly a Coca-Cola banner is on the floor <laughs> behind him. So, you know, it actually spoke to this sort of appetite for, you know, nostalgia for a regime which, you know, was in many ways um, a police state, um, a dictatorship, you know, a, a very um, a great violator of human rights, very oppressive regime, and yet this awkward uh, thing still exists, nostalgia, as it does in many parts of the world. Posing again the sort of paradox one has to live through that of course one's going to have fond memories of one's childhood in some senses, but it seems very wrong to have fond memories of a, of a regime that was, that was so um, repressive. So, Flamini, uh, in seeking to sort of fortify his project, turns to a very brilliant uh, writer who's working uh, in Eastern Europe, unfortunately she died recently, it's the time of called The Future of Nostalgia, and she, she considers this phenomenon, and what a major phenomenon it's become in a consumerist world. Nostalgia is huge money, it's big bucks. You can go to shops and buy memorabilia um, of the Soviet era, bizarre thing. What she does is try to draw a distinction between two different kinds of nostalgia. So, first of all, she talks about restorative nostalgia. Now, restorative nostalgia, she suggests, is the kind of nostalgia that gives nostalgia a bad name, which is a sort of soft focus, um, idealized version of the past, a longing to return to a past or to a home, because that's the root of nostalgia, pain for home, a longing to return to a past and a home that probably never existed in the first place. Brexit. Brexit, make America great again. Nostalgia is, in one sense, a very powerful, very reactionary force in the world right now. Restorative nostalgia does not actually think of itself as nostalgia, but rather as truth and tradition. But then she says, of course, that's not the whole story. There's another kind of nostalgia, which she calls reflective nostalgia, which is when, of course, we play, we, we play our past, we, we revisit the past with this sort of bittersweet pleasure, aware, perhaps, of the way we're... Um, aware, perhaps, of, of our idealizations and our longings and our needs. Re reflective nostalgia dwells on the ambivalences of human longing and belonging and does not shy away from the contradictions of modernity. Restorative nostalgia protects the absolute truths, while reflective nostalgia calls it into doubt. Restorative nostalgia is at the core of recent national and religious revivals. Brexit, Trump, Modi, Bolsonaro, it's everywhere. Um, make India a Hindu country. It never was. It's always more than that. It's, being, it's retrofitting the past to a one monolithic identity. Uh, the return to origins knows two main plots. The return to origins and the conspiracy. Reflective nostalgia does not follow a single plot, but explores ways of inhabiting many places at once and imagining different time zones. It loves details, not symbols. So while restorative nostalgia is around the monumental, the symbolic, reflective nostalgia is around small details, and, you know, like, like the ones the person is working with. So I don't know if you buy this absolute distinction. I don't think one can perhaps rip them apart so easily. But I think it's, it's a useful um, you know, way of going into some of these, these writings. And, and, and Domini makes great use of it. So he says that what his project is, is by no means to try uh, retrospectively say that apartheid wasn't so bad. It's trying to say that there's a certain story that's told about the past that he doesn't buy, which is that uh, 
liberation movement, the African National Congress, comes and saves the masses from the apartheid uh, and delivers them freedom, which he says effaces the, 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 you know, the contributions, the lives, the complexities that he and his family lived through. And in fact, his work is in many ways a homage to his mother, who was perhaps quite a conservative woman, certainly a, a political gradualist rather than a revolutionary. And he says, well, am I supposed to see my mother then as meaningless or as her whole life as without you know, merit because it didn't fit certain discourses? So it's a complex thing he's embarking on here. Um, and he wants to you know, get away from the idea of the masses and the idea that everyone experienced the past in the same way uh, to a much more textured view of, of how people experience the past. And um, as the kind of other side of the coin of this book, you know, Nathan Nostalgia is a wonderfully um, felicitous book. He talks about um, listening to radio as a kid and how, you know, of course, SABC have different radio stations for different languages, Radio Zulu, Radio this, but how even within those things, for example, he talks about a newsreader who was in one sense reading sort of state propaganda, but he'd always put in a little uh, phrase. He'd say, Batingiti, which meant, uh, they must say that I must say this. So he'd say, they, they must say that I must say that uh, terrorists were killed. Da, 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 da. So he was, he was defamiliarizing, and he was saying, he's trying to pay attention to how people lived with imme immense agility and imagination. Even with, he talks about uh, the fight between Kheri Kutsir, the Boxburg bomber, and, was it Ali Fraser? When Gerhardus Kutsir from Boxburg became the first heavyweight champion from the country, and you think. Oh, Joe. Joe Fraser. Spinks. Okay, so that's <laughs> I'm not a boxing uh, fundy, but uh, there, was, there was an important match, and um, you would have thought that he would say that the residents of Katlohan would support African American boxer, but in fact, they rallied behind the the local Boichi Kheri Kutsir. They think the past it delivers up these sort of undogmatic, uh, unorthodox, and sometimes almost blasphemous stories. And I think it's to his great credit that he's trying to take these on, while uh, at the risk of being greatly misunderstood. He's a historian now based at Princeton. It's the, other, the other side of the story was his next book, which looked at the phenomenon of collaboration during apartheid, where he said that, you know, we're taught that it's a story of victims and perpetrators, but there was not only a great deal of collaboration, often uh, as a result of you know, security, uh, as a result of freedom fighters being captured and turned, but generally the system produced all kinds of intimacies, awkward intimacies, codependencies, that is far more complex than the story we're often told. So, you know, he, he, he goes to Primilev Prim for, um, for his epigraph, where he says, we're convinced that no human experience is without meaning or unworthy of analysis. And, you know, again, going back to my earlier point about these writers that are drawn towards the strangeness of the past, how the more you look at it, the less it fits with the idea you might have had of it. The strange and incoherent forces its way forward. Memory opens all its gates, and yet is not open wide enough. Nature struggles to receive, arrange, and honor these strange guests. The strange guests from the past that come to visit us. Can we accommodate them? Uh, can we honor them? You know. um, one of the most, uh, I must say, I was absolutely quite shocked when I read this chapter. He said that, he talks about when being asked how many languages you speak, he normally says five, Zulu, Tosa, Sutu, Tswana, and Pedi, but he says, actually, I also speak Afrikaans. But I don't often admit to it. But of course, he's admitting it to us, which is a complex meta, meta textual thing going on. <coughs> what he goes on to say is that actually Afrikaans was a hugely important part of his life in Katalan. And he goes further and says that actually, in many ways, in the community where he grew up, it was the language of black nostalgia. Of the cons. When people didn't want to leave Sophia Town, they wrote on um, When you know they were trying to say you're still a kid, they said yes, no light or visa light is here. That was you know street language, societal, and so on. The scap is all right. 
Um, <laughs> and the new translate says everything is okay, that's quite coy. It's, sort of, it's shit, but it's okay. Uh, but of course, shit doesn't translate the immense richness of the word cuck. Afrikaans is a wonderful language to swear in. Um, he then, you know, goes on to say that actually in the 90s, I think it was the 90s, there was a huge hit, quite a hit, by an artist called Skin. Let me just play a little bit of it. Starts with by saying Baba um, Where were you, Afrikaans? And it's a sort of the song is a trip down memory lane, um, thinking about moments, important moments of pop culture. Uh, where were you when Brenda Fassi was a Lover's Weekend special? Uh, and where were you when Mercy Pakela was complaining about her hot sneakers? Where were you when Von Chaka Chaka's Marjamini was brewing in Combo? You, you know, so he, he's going through maybe a, a different kind of nostalgia that's maybe not so familiar to some of us, but would resonate with another audience. Um, and saying that the, the, the anchor in question is in Afrikaans, which was in, in so much more than just the so-called language of the oppressor. And then he goes on to say that with his uncles, you know, They'd be sitting there listening to John Coltrane, Miles Davis, Dizzy Gillespie, Basil Kutsia, Donna Brand. Say, Vavas, yeah, you know? yeah. Sonny, yeah, can mix. And they'd say, wouldn't it die? Just listen to that. And uncle would say, as a note, slot too deep in the bunnik. Too deep inside. But it's not saying that Afrikaans. It's, you know, it's Afrikaans as it's spoken. Which is, of course, the language of this province. Wouldn't it die? It was understood that the expression did not require elaboration. That was how jazz was supposed to work. More than that, this is where the music was supposed to be felt, deep in your bullet count, your insights. And it's interesting here because he quotes Herson. Now, Herson, obviously, in another mode as a kind of social analyst, talking about the location or the township or the Bantustan or the homeland. And of course, like all um, repressive regimes, apartheid did huge damage to language. And one of the words that most damaged was homeland for us, which in most parts of the world is a, is a, is a lovely word. But it's, it's ruined that word for us, um, like it's ruined many other words. Um, and he says, you know, Herson describes these places as politically frozen zones, amputated portions of the country laid down in the dust of no man's land. And Jamini mean, says, Eishma Herson, where are my uncles? The township clevers with the tapping floor shine of shoes, Brentwood trousers and violet shirts. Where in this politically frozen zone, this amputated portion of the country, are the men and women who would witty chat in Afrikaans because they felt like it and like Afrikaans? Township, location, lokasi, in Afrikaans, kasi, which is what it's called, kasi. So you see, again, how you know, questions of remembering the past in a country like ours become so entangled and complicated. Um, uh, and it's all sort of there. In, 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 in the sort of inflections of language, which is why I want us to look at it. And even when we go back to Correct, I, I read another book by Herson, wonderful book. Uh, it's called White Scars on, Read, on Reading and Rites of Passage. It's a kind of genre that I'm very fond of, which is kind of, it's literary criticism. It's someone reflecting on books they've read, but not in an academic way. It's sort of like the books that I read during times of my life, why they meant a lot to me, I'm rereading them. I really like that, that kind of genre. Uh, and he talks about writing, um, sorry, maybe King Kong, and he talks about the model from Perfect, and I just had to show a picture of him with a cat, um, who, you know, so in a sense, if you read the Perfect, you just get this, I remember this, I remember that, and it all seems very light, and it all seems very, almost banal. A lot of it's the memories are drawn from pop culture, brill cream, and. But then he, he, he told, he, 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 he led on something that I wasn't aware of, that Perec writes this in 1946 in France, post-war France, recovering from collaboration, occupation, the Holocaust. And of course, many French people were complicit with that. And that he, his, his own family, his parents, 
or killed in that experience. And then he writes this book. So in a sense, its central absence and everything associated is precisely what goes unmentioned. So there's, even within this great pleasure, there's this absence and there's this there's an absence that's, that's sort of present um, in not being mentioned. So persons very aware of the complexities of nostalgia and remembering. But um, what Jamini seems to be saying when he quotes Herson is, you know, Herson can remember his childhood in such richness. Can't I? Can't I have the same access to saying that my childhood was also imaginatively rich? But you can see how complex and risky some of these arguments are, how they could fall into the wrong hands. So they're, they're all pieces that take a risk. All right, so now I'll turn to, um, to Rustin's piece. Um, Herman Charles Bosman, uh, who I'm sure many of you know, he wrote, uh, he killed his brother, he shot his brother, his stepbrother, um, and he was sent to jail um, when he was a young man. He sent to Pretoria Central, which was called Cold Stone Jug. He almost got hanged, but he just got pardoned at the last minute. And he wrote a memoir called Cold Stone Jug many years later. Extraordinary piece of writing. It's one of the great memoirs. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an extraordinary piece. And, and, and at some point in there, he talks about uh, the cons that he spends time with. And he says, there's three types of education in the world. The scientific education, classical education, and <laughs> which I always wanted to be the epigraph to my essay and Dacha, so please don't steal it. Um, so, so this is Rustam's essay, an extract, he says, Dacha, he's mostly a, po a poet, it's a wonderful collection, this Carting Life, it came out in 2006. It's something that can actually be read in dialogue with this piece. Um, he's also a wonderful critic, cultural critic. Um, and this appeared in a, an anthology called the African Cities of Leader from Chimaringa magazine, which is also a lovely archive. The shame of being a man, is there any better reason to write? It's quite a, quite a epigraph. Uh, I am aware that over this lecture series I've been talking a lot about fathers and sons. I'm sorry if it's been a bit male. Um, maybe next year I'll do mothers and daughters. But um, yeah, a lot of it's been about fathers and sons. And fathers and daughters, yeah. Uh, and, and, and what masculinity is and, 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 and what, what being a man is and the mangling, mangled masculinity that he talks about here. Um, you know, portraits of difficult stern fathers in a lot of them in this lecture series. So he says, I first smelled Dachau when I was seven or eight, walking to primary school with my brother through a small felt, a familiar shortcut for school children and workers. So for Proust it was the Madeleine, sorry, and then therefore for Zane's Dachau, which smells, it's the mnemonic, it's the trigger. Our neighborhood New Orleans was new in the 1970s, a community development project by apartheid planners. And so you know, he's, he grows up uh, in an area that's, that's been dreamed up by apartheid's ridiculously ambitious program of social engineering. Um, and it hides this displacement under the euphemism, community development, community scout club. But the roadmap of New Orleans revealed its apartheid truth. No regular grid but curves and crescents, cul de sacs which, while creating an, an idyllic image of community, also pointed to town planning's control. There were only three entrances, exits to the neighborhood, and so it would be easy to close it off. So, what is, what, I, I'm really interested to hear what you thought about this piece. I think it's a sort of um, unusual, I think he's, he's still working on it. It's just a sort of first draft of a much larger memoir. But, this, the, the, you know, it's a piece that continually surprised me. I mean, yes, there's the sort of memoir of, of growing up under the Group Areas Act, which you know, many people have written. But there's also this other story about Dacha and, you know, wanting to be a Dacha worker and the kind of education he's getting or not getting in school and then the kind of other kind of education that he's getting out of school and how they, how they all interact and how they 
how they articulate with matters of class in his own community, which is quite strong in this piece. You know, the, the laborers, his sort of much more um, the strict household, um, and, and what smoking, how smoking is the sort of um, root into this whole story. And you know, as it often is when you're young, in where, where you go to smoke, and what the r routines and regimes are around, around smoking. I remember that well. So he says, my mnemonic life, my coming to memory and thus to human life, starts after the Group Ares Act. So he, you know, that was normal to him in a sense. Um, but he, he remembers his parents during aimless Sunday drives, during the tree-lined parts of town, the names of streets that used to be their haunts in youth rolled off my parents' tongues with just enough nostalgia to hide the hurt on the lingering Tempeliestraat, Malaystraat, as we rumbled through them in my father's old fort. What a thing to go on a Sunday drive with your parents to the places where their families have been removed. What's the structure of feeling that's happening in that car, that journey? Um, but again, you know, there's a sort of ambivalence there that, that you know, his father, in one sense, um, was moving towards a different kind of independence. So, um, he also, and this is something I, I tell um, my writing classes as well, and, I, and again, it's a very obvious point, but maybe, maybe a good one. In, when everyone has an idea, or when everyone has a subject, or when everyone has a place, when everyone has a person, when everyone has anything one wants to write about, one of the great ways of doing that is by breaking it into smaller pieces, by um, thin slicing it into, in this case, Micro geography. So he takes this uh, this place where he's growing up, but then he also shows us that actually there's all kinds of different micro locales in this in this neighbourhood. The guava farm, the shortcut. You know, if you look at a, a an aerial photograph of any city, you'll see the official walkways, and then you'll see what town plan is called desire lines, which is where people actually do walk. So the way people actually move through space. It doesn't correspond, actually, to the way social engineers want them to. It always is evading it or taking a shortcut in some way, which is quite a nice metaphor, perhaps, for the whole essay. The two empty cement dams, Die Dam, which became the site for the most ordinary childhood playing and mischief. Um, the fact that, you know, you could, it was a good uh, place to be hidden. Um, as a seven-year-old, I had a vague sense of what Dacha might be. If I was not performing some show efficiently, my father would ask, Is Jeh Haruk my new stone? <laughs> and of course, you know, he's, he's transliterating the way it would be spoken there in cups, not in, again, official save Afrikaans, but in the glorious uh, Afrikaans that's spoken in our city. Are you stoned? So I knew it caused some form of mental incapacity. Um, but then one day on the on the way to school uh, one morning, a pungent smell wafted past him and his brother, and he says, it smelled strongly of raw peanuts. And when I, Rastam came to talk to us about it, I said, Rastam Dacha doesn't smell like raw peanuts. And he said, I know, but that's just the association it has in my mind. <laughs> so it's, it's sort of, the whole piece is built on a misassociation. Uh, he also said something, I guess maybe poets' minds are wired differently, but he said the smell of shongololos, which we've already had, Reminds him of water kept in stained glass cups. <laughs> so, you know, the way we have these strange associations of memory. That's Dacha, my brother said from the corner of his mouth, they're smoking Dacha. Two years older, he sounded affronted. I was quite intrigued by the openness with which these workers were just walking along smoking the Dacha. They may have hidden the joint in cup palms, but they did so casually, and they couldn't mask the smell, that smell of raw peanuts that still causes me to gag when I smell marijuana being smoked or when I sniff and a bag of heads. So as you've said, Dacha, of course it's marijuana, but it's also, as he said, uh, another word for bitumen, for grouting. It's a, con it's a builder's, construction worker's word. Um, in terms of what kind of intoxicant it is, well, it's, it's often known as the intoxicant of, of forgetting, of, of, of memory loss. You know? 
If you're really slow, you tend to forget uh, what you want to say before you finish the sentence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you really have recall problems. You like, oh, I it was just there a minute ago. So it's it's a sort of uh, discourse on memory, structured through an intoxicant that's around um, amnesia, but also uh, it's a it's an anesthetic. It's a powerful anesthetic. It's a, it's an agent of numbing, numbing pain, as you know. Um, and it's also an agent of, uh, you know, it's often associated with music, and it's associated with digression, not linearity, but um, digression, which is why, you know, hippies are always trying to talk about life, the universe, and everything all the time, because they're just, <laughs> they're just perceiving everything at once, but you can't really live like that, but, but maybe for a little while. So it also is, I would say, the drug of, yeah, so if I say rather than a linear drug, it's one of associative thinking, where that calls to that calls to that. So it's interesting to me that between the first and second, first and second sections, he ends with this identification of it as raw peanuts, which is actually a misidentification. And then he just picks up on another section where he talks about I first tasted raw peanuts when I was four. So it's sort of slipped onto another track. And I think that's also a powerful um, thing the essay can do is that you can have a break and then you can just start from another direction, almost like a cubist painting, from another perspective. It doesn't, it's not bound to the explicitness and logical argumentation of academic writing, where A has to lead to B has to lead to C and you have to show the links. With a more reflective essay, you can sort of jump around, um, you can change gear, you can introduce a second movement it's actually a lovely thing in writing when you've, you've been in one stream and then you start somewhere else. And then <coughs> slowly, one, at some point in the future, they're going to interact. But it doesn't have to be so explicit. So what drives me mad about academic writing is how explicit it is. You know, in an abstract, you have to say, in this paper, I'm going to say this. Now I'm saying this. Now I've said this. <laughs> Having said this in this paper, I'm going to. It's like, oh my god, you know. But um, what about dealing with the implicit? What about not stating everything so obviously? What about not giving us everything? What about not knocking us over the head with your argument, but just leaving it a little bit implicit? I find that a lot of writing out there today is so explicit in its claims. It doesn't leave any space for the reader, because it's telling you everything that it thinks. But the human mind, as we've seen in its compulsion to create story and narrative of just about anything, threads fragments into workable narratives. So this is a piece written in very short paragraphs with spaces between them. They don't always even very much lead on from each other, but um, it gives a kind of impressionistic, kaleidoscopic um, view of his childhood. And um, this sort of peanuts movement takes us into a different part of uh, South Africa, Durban, where they go and visit a uh, farm. And I just want to you know, read this paragraph because I just think it is quite a mesmerizing one. He, he talks about memories of this, but then he talks about a photograph from that place, um, a different ecology, a different climate to what he was used to, Pozuna Tal, humid, overgrown, different crops, different fruit, um, pawpaw and mango, maybe banana, avocado, I imagine now, all part of a subtropical scenery, otherworldly to us from the Boerland not itself unknown for its green landscapes, landscapes of mountain and fenbos, fern and protea, over which we roamed, my brother and I, with our father, often in the winter, climbing rock faces, <coughs> slipping over mossy ledges. That strange country of my father's heart, his own, yet not his own, or, differently, not his own, but which he tried to make his own, to all the strange twisted logic and heartbreak of this heartbreaking country. My father, in winter, somewhere along a steep side of Bain's Cliff outside Wellington. My father, who loved the natural world, tugging at an obstinate king protea, which he would himself stubbornly plant in his garden in New Orleans, where it would wither and die again and again. My father, who would say, protect it, conserve, for whom this is God's earth, it belongs to me too. It is for him I arrive now at this paragraph, crying as I write this, for which I am not ashamed, for which I forgive myself, knowing that in myself crouches something of that mangled masculinity my brother and I inherited from him. Here we are at the age of 
So, I mean, kind of, you know, we were talking about Baldwin yesterday with his commas as the mind. You know, Elizabeth Bishop had this beautiful line that what she looked for in writing was not a thought, but a mind thinking. And the sort of sense in which he's able to notate, like Baldwin, the twists and qualifications and turns of thought, the way the commas have to revise what he's just said, the way the parentheses, the long dashes, <coughs> give us extra information. I mean, what, what information is given in parenthetical punctuation, whether in brackets or dashes, is very interesting always in a piece of writing. The repetitions um, giving the sort of incantatory thing, I think it's a beautiful paragraph. And it also, perhaps more strongly than any of the pieces uh, we've read, shows us this dance of the writing eye and the historical eye because he actually draws attention to the moment of composition. He says, it's for him that I arrive now at this paragraph right here. He brings us right into the unfolding sentence, crying as I write this for which I'm not ashamed. So, you know, if I was having to deal with this as a critic, this is probably the paragraph I'd go to because it seems to be charged with all kinds of things. There's also the question of the natural world and how we're a, t a city and a province of great natural beauty and, and nature reserves and, you know, how that's interacted with our history. Um, it can also be, there's a beautiful poem in the poetry collection which, which, which actually also deals with this moment of them trying to uh, drive through um, the Bay's cliff. So, I will just uh, end by saying, he says, I digress. I was talking yesterday about the paragraph, punctuation at the level of the paragraph, so that you can do macro punctuation. You see the, like the, the immense force typographically and, and, and sort of semantically that a, that a two word paragraph can have after a lot of long involved paragraphs. Um, it's almost as if he's, he's pulling himself back from the emotive register there and says, oh, no, back to the subject, which is Dachau. But Dachau, of course, isn't the real subject. And this is often the case of personal essays. You, what seems to be the subject is not really the subject. Um, there's a great essay that I used to teach with about, it's called, uh, it's, 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 it seems to be about whiskey. But actually, by the end of the piece, you realize it's about alcoholism and all kinds of other things. So, you know, this seems to be about Dachau, but it's, it's really not. Or well, it is, both is and isn't, it's about more. Um, but he, he definitely takes us into, as does Lamini, the, the texture, the verbal texture of his childhood. And I think this is also another great tip for writing, is try to put in bits of remembered and reported speech to Introduce because the eye, the, the, in, in personal narrative or in autobiography, the eye can become overwhelming or overbearing. You know, if it's just I think this, I, I, I. So, a way of leavening that, of putting yeast in, is to try and bring in reported speech, sort of patchwork it in. I mean, in, that, in the Baldwin essay where he said his father, like an ingrown toenail, someone said, what someone else said, and here it begins to, us cigarette smokers might decide to make a pipe. Huddling in dense reeds at the back of the schoolyard, <coughs> smoking cigarette tobacco in a bottleneck, pretending it was Dacha. So, <laughs> actually, just you know, it's, it's, uh, and Dacha lingo might be used by us wannabe toughs. How and is it? Keep in its wife, it's Mandrax. Or in an act of bravado at the school corridor, someone might shout across in greeting, Make a pipe, I say. Make a pipe, I say. <laughs> so, again, it just shows you what can't be translated. I mean, Mark a pipe, I say, make a pipe, I say, that sounds like something from Sherlock Holmes. This is really not equivalent. Um, there's, you know, there are certain elements to language, especially demotic forms of language, colloquial forms of language, and, you know, because so much of the energy of language resides in colloquialism, swearing, profanity, I mean, that's where our most ingenious language inventions come from, like insults, swearing, cursing. Um, it becomes very hard to smuggle it into English, which is this rather unfortunate language because it's the language of finance and governance and politics and it's sort of bland English, the world language. Roger Kipling. Roger Kipling, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I, I sometimes wonder what it must it be like to be in another time speaking another language, because English just seems a bit, a bit tired out sometimes. I don't know. Especially, yeah, anyway. Um, he's trying to introduce other lexical signatures, but he's also translating them as he goes, which is, you know, he could also not have translated that. Anyway, let me go to the end, because I think, as with the Baldwin, he talks about the kind of impossible ideas that you need to hold in your hand at the same time, the ambiguity and ambidexterity and ambivalence that we spoke about yesterday. And I'll just um, end with this. I mean, again, it, it actually it has a sense of a fragment that's been cut off mid midway. It's not the end of the piece by any means. I think he's still um, he's working on it. Um, so we've gone from this, this horror of his uh, biology teacher finding, finding their uh, bottleneck. But they weren't caught. Uh, here and I in the same class had history with Mr. Simpson after the break. History class on a hot Boerland afternoon while stoned. The triple soporific state of torpor of being chaluk and rivaled ever since. <laughs> It was very hard to read. Okay, so then he ends. The Greek roots of nostalgia, or nostos, return home with Algos, pain. But not simply a soft focus recollection of times or things past. It is an ache to return home. But how does one ache for a past that is also marred by the barb of apartheid? What am I looking for in that past? Are the words home and ache adequate at all, accurate at all? To recollect, to describe something that survives only in memory, that survives nevertheless. It has had, that has or had a fullness which no language tries I might from many different angles that no language can summon to my full satisfaction to say this is how it was in all its fullness, that it was full beyond apartheid, that apartheid did not matter at all, and yet that it was all that mattered, that apartheid was at once ever present and never present, that the schism between my ever and never present fractures like the lens into myriad shards, and the image breaks into the multifaceted, as if seen through a kaleidoscope, an image that is individual yet patterned. But beyond the charm of the kaleidoscope, the image remains at a distance, intangible, a chimera of something that is known, but still a chimera, a monster of the lion's head, a great spot in the circus. So yeah, I think he's sort of broken off mid-thought there. He tells me he's finishing it. Um, but I, I, I've, I've taught with this essay for a, lot, for a number of years, and I find that it's one that really resonates with students. Um, they, they, I often read in the feedback forms that you know, really, they're kind of fascinated by it. They didn't really get it all the time. It was strange, but it has really stayed with them. So um, I hope that some of them will stay with you. And um, thank you for being here, thank you for being part of this, and uh, let's take some, yeah, some questions, so we'll find the comments. It's strange because reading and writing it is a very solitary pursuit. 
but it was, it's also the sort of consolation of yeah. connecting with, with, with other subjectivities on the page, you know, feeling a lot less alone. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, strange, it's a strange pursuit. <laughs> Thank you for your comments. Uh, I see the water books by, I could see it for sale in the library.